Australia got integrated into the culture of the people that I call survivors only in its last stages. I mean the last stages of the survivors culture as such when they were at the point of building star forts. Before that, the contacts of the Aboriginal people with this culture were only fragmental. Of course, even those distant connections are overlooked. They are not allowed in the Penguinian history because they always try to convince us that before we were backwards, we lacked sophistication, we lacked technology for intercontinental travel. Of course, that's not true. Let's look at whatever little artifacts and sites in the region have escaped. The controlled demolition and theft of our historic heritage carried out by the penguins. The ancient Egyptian people also used boomerangs. Experiments showed that they also functioned as returning boomerangs. The Egyptian boomerangs are officially called magic wands, so that it won't be that easy for the people to notice the Egypt-Australia connection. Now, this is again from the area of the Jimpi Pyramid. Looks very much Indian, and so does this Ganesh. And as far as the Jimpi Pyramid itself, it appears to be demolished already. But recently a new information emerged showing that probably a part of the structure, part of the walls was saved and then rebuilt at a different location. Most likely the story that this young lady is telling about how the wall was rebuilt by her relatives is true because who would invest nowadays so much work to build a polygonal wall from scratch. Again, this is from the Gimpy area. By the way, on the internet there are long lists of similar artifacts, but it's very hard to find photographs of them. But I did find numerous complaints of citizens who find such things, submit them to the authorities. After that everything disappears, the photographs together with the artifacts, and in some cases even the authorities which have accepted the artifacts deny having done so. And again, same situation as uh, other megalithic uh, sites around the globe, no clue how did they cut the solid basalt. In the vicinity of the famous controversial Gosford glyphs, there seem to be possible very interesting shafts. And the interesting stones resembling most definitely polygonal stonework. On the top of that, these very same uh, boulders appear to be molten on one side and flowing. And so it's um, the full area is very, very controversial. 
most likely we are talking again about the category of metalites and stones which have been grown, cultivated, like uh, which is a very very new, just emerging area of exploration, of which we know very very little. Maybe I could find some new clues in the next few expeditions. Until now I was also completely puzzled. On one side the boulder would look absolutely and completely natural. And yet on its other end there are clear traces of intelligent design. It was really puzzling. And probably the famous Kaimanawa wall in New Zealand is one out of these structures which are on the border of intelligently made and natural. And it's not just artifacts. We also have people that seem to be connected to this Egyptian-style culture. This is an interesting burial from New Zealand. These things are sarcophagus-style, they are carved out of a single piece of wood, and they also had elaborate engravings. Unfortunately, that doesn't show in the only photo that we could find. So in general, their coffins were definitely similar to Egyptian sarcophagi, and the people inside that belong to the Caucasian race. Their features were clearly not the Australian Aboriginal, or Polynesian, or anything of that sort at all. Here is a blonde mummy from New Zealand. As everywhere else in this region, Japan, China, etc., the Caucasian people were the original inhabitants. And not only in that region, also in America, here, this was a red-haired shaman. Her hair was three meters long. So what happened to them in Australia and New Zealand? And this is what uh, happened to them. This is yet another pile of um, the leftovers from cannibal feast because when the Polynesian, um, Melanesian um, cannibal cultures um, settled in the region, they started using the locals as food source. Okay, the forces which were bringing about these changes, they managed to remove the people kill them, get them eaten, but uh, sadly for the penguins who would come later, the bones were still left to testify for their existence. So the penguins had to devise a plan to dispose of these uncomfortable bones. Well, at this point, the Industrial Revolution comes to give a hand and um, this uh, below the chimney that you see is the factory at which uh, some estimated 60,000 non-Maori skeletons were turned into fertilizer products uh, during the 1860s through 70s. Now these tribes with uh, fair hair are easily declared as um, fairy tribes, although there uh, is a good number of legitimate accounts of some pockets left still alive from that uh, population, even when the colonial times uh, started in um, this region of Australia and New Zealand. Here they knew about the practice of the elongated skulls. These were people well connected with the world. They were not almost in complete isolation for 40,000 years, as the penguins tell us. Some aborigines in the area still have uh, hair color, light, golden, that doesn't occur naturally in their race. <laughs> The 
facial features of others also seem a bit uh, mixed with the Caucasian race. And they also put Atlantean fashion bands on their foreheads, the red uh, strip, identical to that in Europe. On uh, the left, on the right are Aborigines. And now uh, the same band we can see on the left is now American native girl. And the deity that you see on the top of their house protecting it with his uh, tongue out in, uh, and in not a very good mood. Also that is celebrated in uh, their uh, dances a lot. It's the same protective uh, deity uh, in the form of a dwarf that was uh, wi widely worshipped in uh, ancient Egypt and in uh, Europe. The eucalyptus oil is also considered as one of the ingredients used in embalming dead people in Egypt, making mummies. So that could point also to a connection to Australia and New Zealand, but not sure because Egypt was lush and tropical maybe not so long time ago, so God knows what kind of trees were growing there as well. That was the megalithic uh, wall in uh, New Zealand that stays unexplored for many years. But now please pay attention to the painting uh, the locals, um, especially in New Zealand, the tattoos that they have done on their faces. If they were developing and living separately from the other cultures of Europe and all over the world, then how come they're doing the exact same thing that everybody else is doing? Tattooing their face. Now, these are ladies from Myanmar in Cambodia. And this is an Aino lady from Japan. Same thing, tattooing her face. And this is a Chinese-style face tattoo. Some tribes in China do it, not all. Now, these are Inuit ladies from Greenland. So did they start doing the same thing like that just by chance? Did it come to their minds independently? No, most likely not. It's more likely that the full art was part of one primeval culture. This is from Borneo. And the Inuits, for example, are just on the other side of the globe from Australia. And these are bare bared ladies from Africa. Same thing, face tattoo. Here, the penguins use the standard trick talking about 4,000 years ago, when practically we have almost zero information of how things were 4,000 years ago, but because it's so long, it's mystical, and it sounds so scientific. And in this mysterious cloud, in this fog of scientifically sounding things, people fo forget to examine the actual evidence at hand, that there are clear connections numerous cultural parallels between cultures which existed centuries ago, not thousands of years ago. Besides the face tattoos, look at the Tilak mark at the forehead of the Aborigine on the right. Millions still use that very same Tilak mark even now in India. 
Jesus Christ is also depicted sometimes as wearing similar tilaks. Sometimes we see Romans depicted also with very similar mark on their foreheads. The reports of uh, shipwrecks that do not fit the official history are abundant in the region and all of them are still waiting for somebody to explore them. But there is explanation for everything. Well, officially these mysteries are not explored because you see it will infringe on the rights of the native uh, people, the aborigines of the region. Which is extremely weird explanation because nobody cares about their rights when they kill them or take away their land etc. But it, when it comes to unveiling the true history, those uh, laws for their protection are recited very loudly in a very weird twist. And here we uh, see people protesting against this um, preposterous behavior, but they don't understand that the protesters uh, that uh, such actions will have very little result. Why? Because until people continue to watch TV and believe in the paradigm that uh, it is normal for the, the country to have rights uh, on the land that you have been born on, until this uh, mistaken belief is not uprooted, no protests will help because the basis of their full paradigm is wrong. The land on which you are born belongs to you, and your body belongs to you, period. Until you continue to watch TV, which mesmerizes you to the point to surrender those basic rights of yours to the state, to the evil state, holding slogans and screaming on the squares will do you no good. The worldwide network of lines and Nazca-like figures is also there in Australia and it's actually relatively well preserved because the continent is so scarcely populated. Officially, they are roads made by the farmers. Really, six lanes wide, boulevard, perfectly straight for 50 or 100 kilometers in the area where there aren't any farmers, doesn't look like a farmer road after all. The real farmer roads are quite different, this is a real one. It follows the terrain, it's not straight, it actually goes from point A to point B. The lifelines seem to be something entirely different, just have a look at them, try to make sense of your own. This is how they look on the ground. Hmm, those farmers must have hired a very expensive, by the way, team of uh, teams of people who measure the earth to make them so straight. And then I can't even think of the expenses they would have made for the equipment to clean all the trees. So here they made an avenue, enough for 10 cars to drive along each other and it wasn't enough, that's why they widened it subsequently. That's why we see a couple of lines next to each other to avoid traffic congestions. People may say, but the farmers do use these lines as roads after all. They do, but this doesn't mean they have built them in the same way like the residents of this village in Iran live in homes which they found ready-made. 